Welcome to Gateway Shabbat Service. We're so glad you're here today. If you're new to Gateway or to Shabbat Service, we encourage you to stop by Gateway Central right after the service. We'd love to meet you and help you answer any questions you may have. If you'd like to give today to Gateway Jewish Ministry, you can use an offering envelope or give online at giving.gatewaypeople.com. Just write Jewish on your offering envelope or select Missions Jewish Ministry online. All of your donation will go where it is needed, most to support Gateway Jewish Ministry projects and partners around the world. To learn about an upcoming Shabbat service, equip classes, groups, or events at all of our Gateway campuses, visit us online at jewish.gatewaypeople.com or join us on social Social media at Gateway Jewish. Now, as we light the Shabbat candles, symbolizing the beginning of Sabbath, let's set the busyness of this week aside and allow God's light and rest to enter our hearts. Shabbat Shalom to you and your family, and thank you for joining us today. Shabbat Shalom. So this is always the scariest one minute of the Messianic service. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidashanu umitzotav veitzivanu lehadlik ner shel shabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has commanded us and inspired us to kindle the Sabbath lights. We celebrate you tonight, Yeshua, Yeshua Tenu, our salvation. We celebrate that you are the light of the world and that you have shown into the darkness of our hearts and that we invite you into this service to shine a light upon us, to encourage us as we lift you up. And I pray that as we recreate this ancient ritual, that Jewish people around the world, when they kindle the light and they light the candle that Yeshua will be revealed as the Messiah of the Jewish people and Messiah of all nations. May you be lifted up tonight and all men be drawn to you in your name that is above every name, Yeshua. Shabbat Shalom. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pri hagafin. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Oh, boy. Beautiful. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Lord, thank you 
for the bread that's risen from the earth and the bread that's come down from heaven. In Yeshua's name, amen. Shabbat Shalom. Greetings. Shabbat Shalom. Let's all rise. Just take it in. Just breathe it in. If you come weary, you're in the right place. If there is a battle waging out here, you're in the right place. Just take it in. Take in his rest. I know a lot of us have been laboring this week. I know, I know we have. Sometimes it feels like it never ends. Sometimes you've experienced so many 100 plus degree days that you're like, when is there going to be a break? But on the seventh day he rested. In the complete Jewish Bible it says, the seventh day is holy because that was the day that God, Adonai, rested to allow what he had created to produce on its own. So as we rest, the universe that God created for us begins to produce. So Father, we just take you in right now and we offer up our praise to you as a fragrance to you, God, that would be pleasing to you, that you would be that you would be familiar with what we offer, that you would come and you would abide with us as we, in one voice, as one people, lift up the name of Yeshua. Lift up the name of Adonai. Declare you the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We declare this one thing. Let's all sing together. Shema
<laughs> I know if you have anything in common with us, there's a battle waging in your life. I don't know your battle. But I know that the battle has been won. And I would like to do something. I'd like to just gather in, in unity. I know you may not know the person next to you. And if you feel comfortable, I would like you just to connect with somebody close to you. And I would just want to pray. I want us to pray together. And take the hand of the person next to you if you feel comfortable. And I just want to bring God's presence into this situation as we're here worshiping and lifting up his name. The biggest shift that I've made in reading the book of Job is that sometimes we are not the instruments of war, but we are the battleground that the war takes place on. And so when we have done everything we know to do, we stand and we declare the goodness of our God. So if we just take a moment, just pray with those around you and speak life into their situation and into your situation as I pray over you. Father, we are your battlefield. We are the ground that you fight on. And while we may get a million things wrong, one thing we will get right is in declaring that you are good. It is who you are. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And so God, I just ask that you would pour out a blessing over your people, that you would, you would let food fall from heaven into every situation, into every life. And let your presence fill this place in the name of Yeshua.
you're grateful that Yeshua is in this congregation, give him a shout of praise right now. Hallelujah! I love that song we sang. I don't know what your circumstance is right now. I don't know what you're going through, but I have good news. The way maker has come to make a way today. One word from God can change your life, but one touch from God can change your destiny. Anybody want to be touched by God tonight? See, Moses was touched by God and it changed his trajectory. And you may be asking God for reconciliation in a relationship, freedom from an addiction, for him to touch your body tonight, I'm here today to tell you that Yeshua wants to touch you. See, here's what it says in Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he didn't heed them just as the Lord had said. Anybody want to heed the finger of God, the voice of God tonight? Just lift your hand if you want a touch from him. See, the same God, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, the finger of God that raised Yeshua from the dead wants to touch your circumstance tonight. The same Rakadesh that rose Jesus, rose Yeshua from the dead. He says, I'm here and I'm going to set you free. The addiction, the broken relationship, it doesn't matter because the same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments is going to write on your heart tonight. The same finger that sent the Ten Plagues is going to send away the enemy from your house tonight. And if you want a touch from the finger of God, just lift your hand right now. See, we were coming into this congregation tonight and my son was running across the street and he grabbed a hold of my finger as he was crossing the street. See. He found provision and guidance and leadership and protection by holding his father's hand. Just reach out and grab his hand right now. He's going to give you provision. He's going to give you guidance. He's going to give you leadership in your circumstance. So right now, Yeshua, we reach out, we touch you, and we say thank you for changing our destiny. And it's in Yeshua's name we pray, and all of his children said, amen, amen. Well, welcome. We are so honored that you're here. We have an amazing service for you, and we're gonna hear an amazing word from Dr. David Rudolph. He is one of our directors at TKU. Many of you know him. Yeah, give him, give him honor right now. And he has a word on the Shema and Yeshua. Before we turn our attention to him, find two or three people and tell them, reach out and touch the finger of God.
open your eyes and your heart to a new experience, to new revelations, to a whole new family. Here at Gateway, our heart is that all of our Jewish brothers and sisters would know their Messiah and that those who already believe would come to know him in a deeper, more meaningful way. Join us once a month for our Friday evening traditional messianic service. It's a time where people of all backgrounds can come together in community to learn about the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and worship the one true God, the God of Israel. Welcome to Growth Path. So good to see you guys. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha, V'chol levavcha, U'v'chol nafshefcha, U'v'chol meyodecha. Davarim, or Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. In the late 1930s, after Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when Jews in Europe were rounded up and sent to Nazi concentration camps, many Jewish parents placed their children in the care of Gentile Christian neighbors in the hopes that their neighbors would protect them until the parents were able to return. Some of these children ended up in Catholic monasteries and convents where priests and nuns watched over them. When World War II was over in 1945, since many of these Jewish parents tragically perished in the gas chambers, rabbis and relatives attempted to track down these children. Lisa Aiken, in her book, The Beauty of the Shema, chronicles one of these attempts. She writes, In May 1945, Rabbi Eliezer Silver from the United States and Dayan Isidore Grunfeld from England were sent as chaplains to liberate some of the death camps. While there, they were told that many children had been placed in a monastery in Alsace-Lorraine. The rabbis went there to reclaim them. When they approached the priest in charge, they asked that the children be released into the rabbi's care. I'm sorry, the priest responded, but there is no way of knowing which children here came 
from Jewish families. You must have documentation if you wish to do what you ask, if you wish me to do what you ask. Of course, the kind of documentation that the priest requested was unobtainable at the end of the war. The rabbis asked to see the list of names of the children who were in the monastery. And as the rabbis read the list, they pointed to those that belonged to Jewish children. I'm sorry, the priest insisted, but the names that you pointed to could be either Jewish or Gentile. Miller is a German name. Markovich is a Russian name. And Svorsky is a Polish name. If you can't prove which children are Jewish and do it very quickly, you will have to leave. One of the rabbis had a brilliant idea. We'd like to come back again this evening when you're putting the children to bed. The priest reluctantly agreed. That evening, the rabbis came to the dormitory where row upon row of little beds were arranged. The children, many of whom had been in the monastery since the war started in 1939, were going to sleep. The rabbis walked through the aisles of the beds, calling out, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, Jewish people, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. One by one, children burst into tears and shrieked. Mommy, Maman, Mama, Mamushka, in each of their native tongues, unquote. Why did the children respond this way? It is because before these children were placed in the hands of Gentile Christians for their protection, their Jewish mothers had put them to bed every night with the Shema on their lips. This was etched in their memories. Even after living in a Catholic monastery for six years and becoming Catholic, such is the depth of the Shema in the soul of a Jew who is raised as a Jew. The Shema is not only recited at bedtime, but also twice at morning prayers and once in the evening service. It is recited over a baby boy before his bris, his circumcision. It is the first prayer that a Jewish child learns. In Israel's Masorah, or tradition, the words of the Shema are supposed to be the last words that we utter before we die. Rabbi Akiva cried out, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad, as the Romans combed his flesh with iron combs because he was a leader of Israel. Jewish martyrs ever since have proclaimed the words of the Shema with their last breath. The Shema is declared at the climax of Yom Kippur. Have you ever wondered what's inside a mezuzah, that little decorated box on the right doorframe of, of a Jewish house? Inside are the words of the Shema. Have you ever wondered why many Jews pray with tefillin, those black boxes that are placed on the forehead between the eyes and are wrapped around the arm, contained within those boxes are the words of the Shema. What is the Shema? Traditionally, the Shema is a prayer that includes three passages of Scripture from the Torah. The first text is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. The second one is Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. And the third text is Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 41. Because the Shema prayer begins with the word Shema, and its first six words 
are the core of the prayer. Those six words from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, are also known as the Shema. So this evening, when I say the Shema, I will be referring to this core version of the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I'd like to talk with you specifically this evening about the Shema and Yeshua. And I have three points. First, the Shema is the Jewish pledge of allegiance to the God of Israel. Second, Yeshua is in the Shema. And third, Yeshua's prayer was that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Let's begin with number one. The Shema is the Jewish pledge of allegiance to the God of Israel. Growing up, most of us probably said the Pledge of Allegiance every day in school, or at least elementary school. And because we've said it thousands of times, I'd imagine that most of us know it by heart. And because it's in our heart, there are certain emotions that are attached to it. What I'd like to do in a moment, in just a moment, is invite all of us to say the Pledge of Allegiance from memory. <laughs> and I'd like to encourage us to notice our emotions as we think about the words that we are speaking. This is not a political thing. Rather, I want us to gain vision for saying the Shema by comparing it to the feelings that we have when we say the Pledge of Allegiance. So for those who would like to participate and are able to stand, I invite you to join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance with our right hands over our hearts. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Clearly, the Pledge of Allegiance is something that most of us have internalized. It is in us, and it brings to the surface various emotions such as thankfulness, loyalty, and identity. But what is the Pledge of Allegiance? For those of us who are American citizens, it is a pledge, a solemn promise of undivided loyalty to our country. In the same way, the Shema is a pledge a solemn promise of undivided loyalty to the God of Israel. When we say the Shema, we are declaring our allegiance to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are basically saying, Lord, my King, I give myself wholly to you. When was the last time we said this to the Lord from the bottom of our heart? And if we've never done this before, I invite you this evening to do so. When I lived in Japan more than 30 years ago as a college student, I rented a room in a place called Karasuyama, Crow Mountain, which was in Teromachi, the temple district. Every night, I would walk back from the train station and pass more than 12 temples where I would hear Buddhist monks chanting their prayers. How did I respond? As a Jew, 
I instinctively began saying the Shema and declaring my allegiance to the God of Israel. It was my way of saying, I am yours, Lord, entirely yours. Most scholars of first century Judaism maintain that Jews in the land of Israel during the second temple period recited the Shema on a daily basis, probably evening and morning. This is also the view of the Mishnah, the foundational text of rabbinic Judaism, which opens on page one with a discussion of how Jews during the New Testament period or the Second Temple period, like Hillel and Shammai, said the Shema. All of this literature suggests that Yeshua and his shlichim, his apostles, like other Jews, grew up saying the Shema every day as a confession of their undivided loyalty to the God of Israel. It was something they internalized as Jews. It was inside of them. Once a teacher of the Torah asked Yeshua, which is the most important commandment of them all? We have Yeshua's reply in Mark chapter 12, verse 29. Yeshua answered, the most important is, and let's all say it together, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you are to love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your understanding and with all your strength. When we declare the Shema in our Shabbat service here at Gateway, we should be saying it as our pledge of allegiance to the God of Israel. And we shouldn't just be saying it, we should be living out the Shema by loving Adonai, our God, with all of our being. Amen? Amen. And this brings us to my second point. Yeshua is in the Shema. When we say the Shema, we pronounce the personal name of God, Adonai, twice. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Many of the sages of Israel believed that there was a hidden meaning to the repetition of God's personal name and the use of the word one in the Shema. For example, in Sifre to Deuteronomy, a Midrashic commentary that goes back to around the year 300 CE, the author highlights the repetition of God's name in the Shema. And he explains that the first reference to Adonai in the Shema points to Adonai's relationship with Israel in the present age. What did the second reference to Adonai refer to? According to the author of the Sifre, the second reference to Adonai points to Adonai's relationship with the nations, the Gentiles, in the messianic age. Sifre makes the biblical case for this messianic interpretation by quoting Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, and showing that the Shema ultimately comes to a prophetic fulfillment in the age to come when the whole world acknowledges that Adonai is one. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9 states, Adonai will then be king over all the earth. In that day, Adonai will be, what does it say? Echad, one, and his name, Echad, one. 
Rabbi Norman Lamb, an Orthodox rabbi and former president of Yeshiva University, explains the significance that Sifre, this early commentary, places on the Messiah in the Shema. Rabbi Lamb writes in his book, The Shema, Spirituality and Law in Judaism, quote, by introducing this eschatological note into the very heart of the Shema, the Sifre places the messianic belief front and center in Jewish doctrine, unquote. In keeping with the tradition of Sifre, I think that we as Messianic Jews and Gentile Christians should also see the Messiah in the Shema. Moreover, I would like to put forward for your consideration that Paul saw Yeshua in the Shema. The Shaliach, the Apostle Paul, writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, he says, For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, through whom are all things, and we exist through him. Here, Paul interprets the Shema in a way that brings Yeshua into the picture. Professor Richard Baucom, a senior scholar of New Testament at Cambridge University, one of my heroes, puts it this way, quote, Paul has in fact reproduced all the words of the statement about Adonai in the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But Paul has rearranged the words in such a way as to, as to produce an affirmation of both one God, the Father, and one Lord, the Christ, Yeshua, that is Yeshua, the Messiah, unquote. But how can Paul read into the Shema both the Father and the Son, since the Shema clearly says that God is one? Have you wondered that question? Yeah, it's a good question. Paul can do this because, as a first century Torah scholar, he understood that the Hebrew word for one in the Shema is Echad. And Echad can refer to a compound unity. For example, we are told in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Levasar Echad. Here the word echad is used to describe a married couple. My wife, Harumi, and I have been married now for 31 years. We, thank you. <laughs> She's actually in Japan right now, so, you know, I'm just thinking of her, you know, how to put her in. <laughs> I'll be okay, thank you. <laughs> We are two people, but in the eyes of the Lord, we are echad. We are one. And she is definitely the better half. As a disciple of Gamaliel the Elder, Paul studied the Hebrew scriptures in depth and understood the range of meaning of the word echad in the Torah. On a side note, for those who are interested in studying biblical Hebrew like Paul, just to let you know, we have two excellent Hebrew instructors at the King's University. And all of you are more than welcome to study with us in our Messianic Jewish Studies program, which is just down the road. And if that's too far for you, you can even take it online. <laughs> Returning to Paul. 
In his interpretation of the Shema in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, he is not advocating for the worship of two gods, the Father and Yeshua, which is what many Jewish people today think Paul taught. Sadly, there is a long history of the traditional Jewish world misunderstanding what the New Testament teaches about God. And there is an equally long history of the church misinterpreting what Judaism teaches about God. For example, a story is told about how one of the popes in the Middle Ages decided that all the Jews had to leave Rome. Naturally, there was a big uproar from the Jewish community. So the pope made a deal. He would have a debate with the member of the Jewish community. If the Jew won, the Jews could stay. If the pope won, the Jews would leave. The Jewish community realized that they had no choice. So they picked a man named Moisha to represent them. Moisha asked for one addition to the debate. To make it more interesting, neither side would be allowed to talk. The Pope agreed. The day of the great debate came. Moisha and the Pope sat opposite each other for a full minute before the Pope raised his hand and showed three fingers. Moisha looked back at the Pope and raised one finger. The Pope waved his fingers in a circle around his head. Moisha pointed to the ground where he sat. The Pope pulled out a wafer and a glass of wine. Moisha pulled out an apple. The Pope stood up and said, I give up. This man is too good. The Jews can stay. An hour later, the cardinals crowded around the Pope and asked him, what happened? The Pope said, first, I held up three fingers to represent the Trinity. He responded by holding up one finger to remind me that there was still one God. Then I waved my finger around me to show him that God was all around us. He responded by pointing to the ground and showing that God was also right here with us. I pulled out the wine and the wafer to show that God absolves us from our sins. He pulled out an apple to remind me of original sin. He had an answer to everything. What could I do? Meanwhile, the Jewish community crowded around Moisha. What happened, they asked. Well, said Moisha, first he said to me that the Jews had three days to get out of here. <laughs> I told him that not one of us is leaving. Then he told me that this whole city would be cleared of Jews. I let him know that we were staying right here. <laughs> and then asked a woman, I don't know, said Moisha. He took out his lunch and I took out mine. <laughs> My point is that it's easy to misunderstand one another, especially when we're talking about profound subjects like the nature of God. For this reason, Paul felt the need to make it clear to the Corinthians, many of whom came from polytheistic backgrounds, that there was only one God. That is why in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 through 6, Paul prefaces his description of Yeshua with a clear statement that God is one. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, for even 
if there are so-called quote-unquote gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as indeed there are many quote-unquote gods and many quote-unquote lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. Having established the oneness of God, then he goes on to say, and one Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, through whom are all things, and we exist through him. Paul worshiped one God, but he saw within the Shema, in the name Adonai, and in the word Echad, room for what scholars today refer to as Christological monotheism. Okay, let's all say that together. <laughs> Christological monotheism. Very good. That is a monotheism in which the Messiah participates in the divine identity of the God of Israel. We can think of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, as Paul's Messianic Jewish version of the Shema that was inspired by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. What's also important to realize is that the early church fathers took Paul's messianic version of the Shema and incorporated it into the opening words of what became known as the Nicene Creed. In other words, the Nicene Creed adopts Paul's messianic interpretation of the Shema. When we declare the Shema at home or here at, Gateway, at the Gateway Shabbat service, let us see Yeshua in the Shema, as Paul did. When we say Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad, let us think of the Father and the Son. And in our hearts, let us declare with undivided loyalty our allegiance to the God of Israel and his King Messiah. Even as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, echoing Isaiah 45, therefore God exalted him, the Messiah, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Yeshua, the Messiah, is Adonai, to the glory of God the Father. And this brings us to my third and final point. Yeshua's prayer was that we would be one as he and the Father are one. When the Shema is read from a Torah scroll, as we did this evening, there is a secret message in the scroll that only the reader can see. Would you like to know what it is? Are you interested? Don't have time. Sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I'll tell you. Typically, all the Hebrew letters in a Torah scroll are the same size. However, our sages made an exception when it came to the words Shema and Echad. The first word of the Kor Shema and the last word of the Kor Shema. When the scribe writes Shema and Echad, he makes the last Hebrew letters of both of those words, the Ayan and the Dalet, very large. Here is a picture of what it looks like. What is this encoded message that our wise sages left us? Together, the two, the two letters, ayan and dalit, spell the word aid, which means witness. Let's all say aid together. Aid. aid. Very good. A plus. <laughs> A plus. That means witness. For example, the Lord says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, Atem Edai, 
You are my witnesses. When the letters for aid are reversed, they spell the word da, which means knowledge. In other words, the encoded message in these large letters from the Shema, according to Jewish tradition, is that we are called to bear witness to the world about the knowledge of God described in the Shema. Isn't that inspiring? But how can we bear witness in the fullest sense of the word aid if the people of God are divided? The rabbis understood that division, division compromises our witness, and therefore they promoted the ethic of Yehud Hashem, unifying the name of God. The idea here is that Kol Yisrael, all Israel, is called to reflect the name of God, even as King David says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 22 through 23, how great are you, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself? Here we see that Israel is called to reflect God's name on on the earth. Israel testifies, it bears witness to the oneness of God, the goodness of God, the compassion of God, the power of God, and the word of God. When the people of Israel are divided, it is as though God's name is split and the world cannot see the fullness of God's glory. When I was at Cambridge University working on my PhD, I would sometimes go to the King's College Chapel to pray. At the top of the wooden double doors at the west entrance, there is a Hebrew engraving of the Tetragrammaton, the personal name of God, yud Hey vav Hey. The first time I saw it, I was so excited. There's Hebrew on the doors of the chapel. But then I soon realized that when the doors are opened, the name of God is split in two. You can imagine how shocked I was to see this. And if I was shocked, how much more in horror was the Jewish community when the chapel first opened more than 500 years ago? Have you ever seen the name of God split in two? Maybe you've never seen it split in Hebrew on the King's College Chapel doors, but whenever we see schism or unnecessary division within the people of God, we are witnessing the name of God being split. The principle of Yehud Hashem, unifying the name of God, not only applies to Israel, but it also applies to the body of Messiah, the church. For the church is also called to be an aid, a witness of the knowledge of God on the earth. Yeshua prayed, that his disciples would be in such complete unity that the world would see the Father and the Son through their witness. In John 17, Yeshua prays, I have revealed your name to the men you gave me out of the world. I am not praying only on their behalf, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony that they will all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. I pray that they will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. The glory you gave to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. In Hebrew, echad kamo she'enachnu echad. I in them and you in me that they may be completely one so that the world will know that you sent me. I made known your name to them, and I will continue to make it known. 
Here in John 17, Yeshua is praying for us, for you and for me and for our children, for future Messianic Jews and future Gentile Christians, that we would become echad, one, as the Father and the Son are echad, one, a direct allusion to the Shema, so that our united testimony will impact the world to believe in Yeshua. Do you think that Yeshua's prayer will be answered? Some of our prayers go unanswered, but personally, I think all of Yeshua's prayers are going to be answered. And if this is accurate, then we are headed toward unity. Isn't that great news? That's great news. But this brings us to the practical question, how will we get there? And what can we do to hasten the day of Yehud Hashem on the earth? There are many factors involved, but there are certain first things that must be addressed if we are to arrive at the achdu ta'amuna, the unity in the faith that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. For many years, Father Peter Hawken gave vision to the Pentecostal world and the Catholic charismatic world and the Messianic Jewish world concerning the importance of the people of God working toward unity. He maintained, and I think he was correct, that the granddaddy of all divisions in the church is the one between Christ Gentile Christians and Messianic Jews. And that until this ancient schism is healed, we can never truly overcome the other divisions within the church and experience the oneness that Yeshua prayed for. This is because the Jew-Gentile relationship is fundamental to the nature of the church. The church, by definition, is a table fellowship of Jews and Gentiles in Messiah. Amen. <laughs> what can we personally do to heal this deep relational rupture that has existed between Jews and Gentiles within the church for almost 2,000 years. What can we do about that? We can devote ourselves to prayer, for sure, and nothing of lasting significance will happen without this. But there are other things that we can do as well. One is something that we're already doing by being here tonight at Gateway, we are learning through experience what it means to be Jews and Gentiles as Jews and Gentiles to worship together in the local church. And through this, we are coming to realize that this relationship between Jews and Gentiles in Messiah is one of interdependence, mutual blessing, and mutual humbling. It's really beautiful, and we're all a part of it. A second thing we can do is to get involved with Toward Jerusalem Council II. This is an organization that is working toward the world, worldwide reconciliation between leaders of both Christian and Messianic Jewish communities. The vision that God gave Rabbi Marty Waldman, the founder of TJC2, was to work toward a second Jer Jerusalem council that would be the inverse of the first one described in Acts chapter 15. Whereas the first council was made up of Jewish believers in Yeshua who decided not to impose on the Gentiles the requirements of Jewish law, so the second council will be made up of Gentile church leaders who will one day recognize and welcome Jewish believers without requiring them to abandon their Jewish identity and practice. 
all of us can help TJC2 continue its important work until we finally see a second Jerusalem council come to pass. Do you want to see that? I do too. Let's see it together. A third thing we can do in the spirit of Yeshua's prayer and Yehud Hashem, unifying the name of God among the people of God, is to get involved in the new Gateway Center for Israel. I want to encourage all of us to come out for the big event this Tuesday evening at the Dallas campus. Let's listen to Pastor Robert as he shares what the Lord has placed on his heart about this new ministry. My friends, I believe that this is an historic event, and I don't say that lightly. The Gateway Center for Israel has a mission to change the way the church relates to Israel. The center is going to provide all kinds of ways that all of us can get directly involved in. It's exciting that we can play even a little role in healing the division between the church and the Jewish people, and in so doing, contribute to Yehud Hashem. Let us grow in this vision. So when we say the Shema here at the Gateway Shabbat service, as we're going to do in just a moment, or at home, let's remember the secret message in the Torah scroll. Think of those two big Hebrew letters in the words Shema and Echad, the Ayan and the Dalet, which together form the word aid, the Hebrew word for witness. Let us be witnesses of the knowledge and the glory of God and not split the name of God. When we say Echad, when we say Echad, let's remember Yeshua's prayer that we would become Echad, one, even as God is one so that the world may believe in Yeshua, the promised one. This evening, we have talked about the Shema and Yeshua, and I had three points. First, the Shema is the Jewish pledge of allegiance to the God of Israel. Second, Yeshua is in the Shema. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Third, Yeshua's prayer was that we would be echad, one, as he and the Father are one. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> Thank you. Wasn't that a great word? Can we just stand up to our feet as we give God praise? After a word like that is delivered, you may be thinking to yourself, how do I respond to that? The Shema, Yeshua, oneness, Yeshua in the Shema, the pledge of allegiance to the God of Israel. What is my responsibility with this great revelation that I've just received? I want you to know that this is a moment in which you can respond to, to Yeshua, the God of Israel. And you can respond in such a way that he can touch your life. And you can leave different than the way you came in. So I'm going to ask our, our leaders to come forward, and we're going to have some leaders down here at the front. And if, if you would like to, to join me in just praying for the nation of Israel, praying that the Jews would come back to their first love, Yeshua, I want to invite you to come and pray with us so that we can see the power of God in the nation of Israel. I also want to ask you if you would like to pray that Jews and Gentiles would be unified so that we could experience the commanded blessing of God 
then please come and pray. And we never want to close the service without meeting your prayer need. So no matter what it is, whether it's healing in your body, reconciliation of a relationship, seeing a financial situation breakthrough, no matter what the circumstance is, if you want to receive Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, we want to pray with you. And there's never any shame in asking for prayer. So in just a moment, we're going to have one more worship song. But if you have any prayer need in your life, I want to invite you to come. Let's worship. Shema. Hey, there we go. We want you to please continue to come forward for prayer, for any kind of prayer need, no matter what it is. Don't leave here thinking, I should have come for prayer, and, and, and then go without getting prayed for. God really wants to meet your, your, your prayer requests. I want to remind everyone about what Dr. Rudolph mentioned, the event this Tuesday night, September 10th at the Dallas campus. It's called Love Israel. You can register for it by going online, uh, gatewaypeople.org slash loveisrael, and uh, you'll be deeply blessed if you come. Also, I want to invite you to our next Shabbat service, which will be right here on October 4th, and I'll be speaking about Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is, in Judaism, the holiest day in the scripture, and so we, uh, I really hope you'll come. It's it's one of, the, one of my favorite things to talk about. The only day that the Bible actually commands all of Israel to fast all day long. So that's not the day of it. It's a few days before it. So we'll have food. You come and stay for the Onig. I know you'll be blessed. Praise God. Also, uh, I want to thank you. Speaking of food, I want to thank you for helping us last month. Uh, as we had all the food and as we do every time. And you were so good at um, just honoring the facilities people and, and just we left the building so much cleaner than, than, uh, uh, than perhaps we have in the past. It was really good. And finally, I want to remind everyone that the growth path starts uh, this weekend. And so the Saturday classes are all full, but there are still some slots on Sunday. So I hope you'll come to that. Don't forget your, to get your kids, and let's look to the Lord for, the, for his blessing. Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, Yair Adonai panavalecha, 
v'hunehecha, yisaronai panavolecha, v'yasum lecha, shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of the Messiah, Yeshua, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.